Hello. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Gilbert Hosts. Today, our broadcast is entitled Parkinson's Disease and the Gut. And this will give us a chance to delve into some very troublesome Parkinson's symptoms that many people with Parkinson's disease have to deal with. And these include constipation, bloating, abdominal pain, nausea. And I know you're eager to hear what our expert has to say about these symptoms today. So I'm very excited to introduce today's guest who will help us to navigate these very difficult issues. And that is Dr. Ali Keshavarzian. He is a gastroenterologist with expertise in Parkinson's disease. And that is a very unique combination. So we're thrilled to have him here with us. Dr. Keshavarzian will start us off with a brief presentation and then he is here to answer your questions. So get prepared for that. Now to formally introduce Dr. Keshavarzian, he is the Josephine M. Dyron Fourth Chair of Gastroenterology Professor of Medicine, Physiology, Anatomy, and Cell Biology, as well as Associate Dean for Faculty Mentoring, all at Rush Medical College in Chicago, Illinois. And he's also the director of the Rush Center for Integrative Microbiome and Chronobiology Research. Prior to coming to Rush, he was the chief of gastroenterology at two other academic institutions, the Edward Hines Junior VA Hospital and Loyola University. He is a clinician scientist gastroenterologist and has expertise in the fields of gut microbiota, microbi mi microbe host interaction, barrier function, and the impact of environmental factors on the gut. So welcome, Dr. Keshavarzian. We are very honored to have you here with us today. And I know our audience is eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, for the invitation and opportunity. Uh, to uh, talk to you all on a topic that, in my experience, I believe is no introduction to you. You know how important the symptoms uh, are related to ga gastroenterology is in patients with Parkinson's disease. And yet, it, in my experience, it appears that the physicians are not as... Uh, concerns uh, as you are, uh, neurologists don't want to deal with the GI and gastroenterologists get intimidated with neurological disorder. For it's a no man's land and, uh, and that was the reason I got interested in the topic and we created a special clinic, it's a multidisciplinary clinic, we call it uh, GI uh, Parkinson. Uh, disease clinic, and I call it uh, Parkinson gut, to fill that gap. And it's my hope in the next 10, 15 minutes, I give you the overview of the interaction of uh, gastrointestinal tract and Parkinson, and then looking forward to uh, 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 be able to answer your questions. If I may start with my uh, short presentation. Absolutely. Take it away. Okay. You, it's known to you that patients with Parkinson's disease have wide range of GI symptoms that is traveling and that symptoms negatively impact the quality of life of patient with Parkinson's. And I just arbitrarily divide them to symptoms related to uh, upper GI tract, and that include bloating, nausea, poor appetite, abdominal pain. And one thing I didn't put in there is uh, difficulty in swallowing that we can talk about it uh, later. And the lower uh, uh, GI issues uh, that present itself by constipation, although there is rather arbitrary separation of upper and lower because issues in upper GI tract, such as motility, can cause constipation, and constipation can promote nausea, vomiting, uh, and bloating, and we can talk about it down the road. But let's talk about the constipation now. Um, it really depends on eye of beholders that what constipation means. 
by definition, the constipation is less frequent bowel movement, less than three bowel movement a week, or difficulty in passage of a stool. In my opinion, constipation should be defined as unsatisfactory bowel movement, unsatisfactory defecations. Because uh, if the person used to have two bowel movement a, uh, a week all his or her life, then although by definition is constipation, as long as it doesn't bother the patient, it shouldn't bother the doctors. But one thing that I want to highlight that not all constipations are the same in patients with Parkinson's disease. Many patients' constipation is due to a slow gut transit. The same way that Parkinson makes movement is slow, the all the uh, muscles in the extremities are slow, it does the same to the gastrointestinal tract. And that can result in overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, they call it SIBO. And, and you can imagine that we all eat food with lots of bacteria. If the intestine move along nicely, like a river, it's no time for the bacteria to sit to grow. When the intestine slow down, then would give opportunity for the bacteria to grow. And they produce the product when they use the food you eat. And one of them is methane that is responsible for odorous gas. And also methane by itself further slow down the intestine and create the vicious cycle. And that can cause constipation and other symptoms. Now, why is it that um, a small uh, and large intestine are slow in patients with Parkinson? We think is the same as the slowness in other parts of the body is a neuropathy, and that could be with a variety of reasons. As it's important to identify those, and that is what we are trying trying to do in our uh, laboratory, because knowing the cause will give us a closer to identify a more effective treatment. But at the present time, for a slow transit, lifestyle changes and when needed medications are the way to go. And if we use them appropriately and properly, I believe it's been very useful. The other type of constipation which in my opinion is extremely common in patients with Parkinson's disease, what we call them dyssynergic defecation. That is, the patient feels that there is a stool in the rectum, but they are unable to expel it, unable to empty it. Or when they empty, they have to strain a great deal, and at the end, they are not satisfied. They feel that there is uh, something still left behind. And by the way, that dyssynergic defecation can further slow, not, uh, slow down the transit. You can imagine if you have got a blockage, the intestine is smart. They say, I'm going to slow down because there is no point pushing it because there is a blockage further down the road. And for this one, the laxative is not going to do any good. And that requires a local treatment, such as pelvic floor physiotherapy, and also increasing the stool bulk. And by increasing the, uh, the stool uh, volume, that would make rectum to respond better. And also topical treatment, suppository. And many of you know that even manual defecations is the, the way to start. But it is my hope with the uh, pelvic physiotherapy, bulking agent, and sometimes suppository, the need for um, manual defecation will completely uh, decrease. Although constipation is a major symptom in patients with Parkinson, there are other symptoms as well. And one of the uh, relatively common problem is gastroparesis that I will um, highlight in the next slide. 
May I have my next slide, please? Yes. Uh, the gastroparesis is a medical term for a slowness of gastric emptying. The food that we eat needs to get out of the stomach to the small intestine for absorption. And it's, uh, the time that food uh, uh, resides in the stomach depends on the type of food that we have, high fat and bulky food with a high fiber slow, uh, stay in the stomach uh, more and the liquid and soft food and low fat will empty the stomach faster. The same thing as I mentioned to you, patients with Parkinson's, they have a slowness in the small and large intestine. Their stomach is also slow and the gastric emptying is slow. And you can imagine that when you have food in your stomach that doesn't empty uh, very easily, uh, your uh, patients will have early satiety, poor appetite, fullness, and bloating and discomfort. And the way to treat, first of all, in my opinion, it should be documented by, by appropriate testing, which is gastric emptying test. And then if the patient has truly gastroparesis, initially one may improve the symptoms by lifestyle changes, eating the smaller meal, low fat, uh, low bulking uh, the food. But you have to remember that if you completely eliminate the fiber, you are going to worsen the constipation. Therefore, it is a very uh, delicate balance. Uh, but important part is to avoid medications that slow down the transit. Some of the blood pressure medication has slowed down the trans uh, uh, stomach. Uh, opiate painkillers for sure would do it. A stress, a stress, poor sleep can uh, slow down the uh, uh, gastric emptying. Constipation, is specifically dyssynergic defecation, can uh, slow down the gastric emptying. For you can imagine, that if you have got upper GI symptoms, and some of the patients would say, I don't have constipation, whereas when we do the x-ray, the colon was full of a stool, treating the constipation would also improve the upper GI symptoms, such as bloating uh, and symptoms of gastroparesis. Improving the um, uh, uh, constipation will make the stomach to empty faster. But there are other GI symptoms in addition to what I mentioned, one of them is bloating. Uh, in my experience, that is the most common symptoms that bothers patients specifically if the bloating is associated with passage of gas, which is odorous, but as you know, many patients with Parkinson uh, have a uh, problem with the smell, the loss of a smell, I typically ask the partner about it because it's very important. If the uh, passage, uh, gas is odorous, then uh, it most likely represents a small bowel bacterial overgrowth that needs a specific treatment with the course of antibiotics. I mentioned that constipation can worsen the gastric emptying, therefore treatment of constipation, and also looking for uh, uh, there's some food that trigger and avoiding that. Abdominal pain is a, a tricky one. And I uh, divided them to Parkinson gut pain and neurogenic pain. The Parkinson gut pain is, is a consequence of abnormal uh, intestinal function associated with constipation, for example. And patient would tell the pain is uh, crampy, colicky, associated with uh, food, get worse after food, get better after bowel movement. And therefore, we should treat the Parkinson gut, uh, as I uh, highlighted before, to get rid of the pain. The other type of pain is a is not a crampy, is a sharp uh, uh, and uh, rather like a needle pain and sometimes is associated with off response and these are uh, the type of patients that uh, adjusting the liver dopa uh, dose um, will improve it. And in fact, that's a tricky one. Patient come to me with abdominal pain, I'm a gastroenterologist. I adjust the liver dopa uh, uh, drugs and get better. And uh, 
I don't have that major issue at Rush because I uh, am collaborating with the uh, Parkinson doctors, but sometimes uh, uh, one needs to adjust the Parkinson treatment. And the other one is a neurogenic pain that one uh, sees in patient with Parkinson and treatments such as uh, gabapentin can be useful. But the point is that one should uh, look at pain not as a, a uniform uh, condition and one needs to uh, uh, listen to the patient and identify the type of pain uh, and uh, treat accordingly. The other important part I just want to highlight that having Parkinson would not immune you for other diseases that are associated with abdominal pain, kidney stone, gallstone, and so on. Uh, nausea is a major issue, in my opinion. Uh, most of it due to medication. Unfortunately, unfortunately many of the Parkinson medication cause nausea, uh, but uh, gastroparesis, delay gastric emptying can do it. And by the way, gastric emptying um, can affect the acid reflux. If you have delay emptying, you can imagine you've got acid reflux. And sometimes you have it with the classic symptoms of heartburn indigestion, but sometimes with the nausea. One symptom that is not being uh, um, taken uh, more seriously and is uh, very um, important for the quality of life is diarrhea. Uh, and that diarrhea is due to constipation. If I about to call him overflow diarrhea, you can imagine if the tube, any tube get clogged up and you keep pouring water on it, it's gonna just uh, overflow. And in fact, that is very important. Patient coming to me with diarrhea and in fact, they're giving anti-diarrheal medication. And I say, no, it is because of constipation. And uh, the way we document it, we do a simple x-ray and we see the stool is full of, uh, uh, the colon is full of a stool and treat the constipation to prevent diarrhea. And that is very, very important. And of, of course, the diarrhea can be due to overgrowth of bacteria that requires uh, additional treatment. Um, the GI tract is uh, not just um, um, causing the symptoms. Uh, there are um, other, um, can I have the next slide, please? There are other means of uh, interaction between uh, GI tract and the Parkinson disease. In fact, the first person proposed that Parkinson may start from the gut was uh, Dr. Barak from Germany, but he thought that this uh, toxin or, pat or the bacteria uh, can get to the uh, GI tract uh, and cause the issues. But the point is, as many of you may know, the cause of Parkinson is loss of the neuron containing, the, sorry, dopamine containing neuron. And it appears the trigger for uh, those neuron death is a, a molecules called uh, Lewy body, this alpha synuclein aggregate. Alpha synuclein is a normal protein, but when it get misfolded and get aggregated, it become toxic uh, uh, to the neuron, especially dopamine containing neuron that cause Parkinson. One thing that we still don't know, where that uh, um, Lewy body um, starts, is it in the brain? Or is it from the outside the brain that uh, move and migrate to the brain? And also, uh, how, why is it that the normal protein, alpha synuclein, become aggregated in patients with Parkinson? Now, there are compelling data in the last two decades that alpha synuclein aggregate, the Lewy body, start from the GI tract and then move to the brain either through the nerve or systemically. And if that is the case, knowing why that office nuclein aggregate and cause Lewy body in the gut would be a major step to identify medications to prevent or at least delay the onset of uh, Parkinson disease. Whether the Lewy body is generated in the intestine or in the brain, we have to see why. 
it's the data now shows that the presence of inflammation is a key to cause aggregate of that alpha-synuclein. And in the last 15 years, our group and others have shown that in inflammation in intestine may be a trigger for misfolding of that key protein to cause Lewy body that either in the gut or in the brain, and if it's a gut, has to migrate to the brain to cause loss of dopamine and Parkinson's disease. And in fact, people with inflammation in the gut, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, have a higher risk of getting Parkinson's disease down the road. Now, the question is, why is it that gut become inflamed? And that will come the question of microbiota. We are more bacteria than human. In fact, I always tell my students that we shouldn't be very uh, um, proud of being human or brag about it. We are really an Uber for the bacteria to move from point A to point B. We have more bacteria in our intestine than human cells. We have more bacterial gene than human gene. We have trillions of bacteria in our intestine. And those bacteria is in um, mutual uh, coexistence with, with us. And in fact, their presence can be very useful for us. It produces important uh, uh, metabolites, nutrition, vitamins such as vitamin K and so on. But those bacteria can change and become angry and become hostile and create a disease state. And one of the possibility for that gut inflammation in patients with Parkinson's disease is that our bacteria in intestine will change, become hostile, that will create a, a, a state of inflammation in the gut. And also that the state of inflammation in the gut will create the inflammation systemically in the brain and would aggregate that officer nuclein in the gut that we have shown as well as in the brain that lead to um, Parkinson's disease. Now, the question is, uh, why is it that bacteria in patients with Parkinson's disease is abnormal, which we have shown it. We were the, uh, one of the first that reported that bacteria in our uh, in patient with Parkinson's disease is abnormal in 2015. And since then, over 30 groups all over the world have shown the patient with Parkinson's disease have abnormal bacteria. The question that we still don't know is the chicken and egg business. Was it the abnormal bacteria? cause Parkinson or Parkinson cause abnormal bacteria. In my opinion, even if it's Parkinson cause abnormal bacteria, still become important because abnormal bacteria will put the oil in the fire and create a vicious cycle and cause more damage and more of a synuclein aggregate and cause progression of a disease. Uh, genetics obviously is important. Um, our bacteria is more similar to our mother and our, our siblings, but even in a, um, uh, identical twins, our bacteria is different, but there are some similarity. And therefore the gene can make bacteria in patients with Parkinson more susceptible to change. But more important, importantly, the environment. Environmental factors can affect the microbiota of bacteria um, and make them uh, hostile. That could be um, use of different uh, medication, environmental toxin, the food, especially food in high fat um, and high sugar. Um, uh, poor sleep, stress, pretty much uh, the so-called modern uh, society environment uh, that will uh, promote hostile microbiota. And by the way, uh, modern uh, life uh, style is associated with increased risk of Parkinson, and that may be that may be true. Uh, changes in microbiota. Well, I uh, 
went overview of symptoms of gastrointestinal tract, a potential role of uh, intestinal special microbiota in either causing Parkinson or perpetuate the, uh, the disease course of Parkinson uh, through the what we call him gut brain access. But intestinal tract can also be relevant in treatment of Parkinson's disease. You can imagine if the patient has gastroparesis, if the patient has slow small bowel transit, it would um, disrupt the normal absorption of the food. If your uh, sorry, normal absorption of the medication. If the uh, Parkinson medications uh, sitting in the stomach and not getting to the intestine to get absorbed, there is no good, and that will one of the reason for uh, erratic response to uh, medications such as levodopa. Many of you know that uh, food can uh, interfere with the absorption of the, um, your cinnamon, and, uh, and that's why we advise a dietary um, modification, especially time of eating um, and time of uh, taking food. And by the way, time of eating is also important because it affects the uh, circadian and uh, affects the bacteria. We can talk about it during um, our question and answer. And lastly, some of the bacteria in intestine have the enzyme that would uh, metabolize the uh, liver dopa and those enzymes unfortunately cannot be inhibited with carbidopa and therefore it prevents uh, the orderly absorption of the liver dopa from the intestine and uptake from the brain and that can cause increased uh, need for the liver dopa which we have already published and may increase the severity of dyskinesia and therefore manipulating the gut bacteria either uh, through the diet, prebiotics, probiotics. Um, one even can improve the treatment of uh, Parkinson and response to levodopa. And I look forward to discuss uh, all these uh, um, issues with you during the question and answer that Dr. Gilbert uh, will moderate. And I'd like to invite Dr. Gilbert to help me to uh, uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much. Fantastic. I just learned so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Keshavarzian, for all that uh, amazing information. We have questions pouring in, and so we're going to start our, our Q&A. Um, and again, keep, keep those questions rolling in and join us by submitting your question via the live chat. So uh, our first question is related to diarrhea. You mentioned this in your talk that diarrhea is often associated with constipation and is really a symptom of constipation. And we have a number of people who want a little bit more information about that. They have explosive diarrhea. This seems very, very disruptive of their lives. Um, what, what are your suggestions how to, how to help this? Number one is uh, we really need to make sure uh, the, the underlying cause of diarrhea. The first, uh, the fact that you have Parkinson would not make you immune from having other diseases that uh, cause diarrhea. Um, Parkinson is a disease of older age, and that's why it's very important to have colon cancer screening, because one of the causes of uh, changes in bowel habit and diarrhea is uh, colon cancer. Um, another uh, cause that is not so relevant to um, uh, Parkinson, but is very common in uh, older uh, population is microscopic colitis. These are, that's the disease that when we put a colonoscopy and look at it, it looks normal, but when we take a biopsy, we will see the inflammation. For uh, my point is that one needs to make sure that other causes, celiac disease, for example, uh, the problem with um, absorption because of uh, decreased function of the pancreas um, or associated disease such as uh, diabetes 
or medications, many medications, simple medications such as PPI, the omeprazole that you get, you get over the counter um, can cause diarrhea. For you, uh, the other one is that many people nowadays take di uh, the diet products. Diet products, it has laxative in it. And if you take, for one of my patients, I remember that he had multiple, multiple tests. And during the uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes I was interviewing him, he went through six or seven um, uh, uh, pieces of the uh, chewing gum. And I asked him, by the way, when did you sort of have diarrhea? He said, when I stopped smoking, I said, when you stopped smoking, you, you took the chewing gum and it was, diarrhea was because he had a, a sugar-free chewing gum. But that is the point I'm making that we have to make sure we exclude other cause of diarrhea. But the most, almost exclusively 95%, close to 100% of diarrhea in patient with Parkinson is a consequence of constipation. And the way you make it like the way you suspect it is that you will have constipation, no bowel movement for three or four days, five days, and then you get explosive diarrhea, which is uh, with incontinence. It's got lots of uh, odor to it, and it got some pieces of a stool in it. And the way we make a diagnosis is a simple X-ray that you will see the colon is full of the stool, and the treatment is cleaning your colon. Taking laxative is not going to do any good. You have to clean your colon as if you are having the colonoscopy. And then you have treatment to prevent the constipation. That is the way to go. And if it is a mild constipation, using over-the-counter laxatives such as Miralax and bulking agent is okay. And But if it is more severe, we need to have a treatment. I think in one of the slides, I didn't explain it. I went through them. There are now multiple uh, medications available in the slow transit uh, lenses, Amitiza, TrueLens, and uh, uh, Montegrity, all of them can be used. Uh, the other important one, if your constipation is a consequence of this synergic defecation, laxative is not going to do you any good. You really have to have a pelvic floor uh, physiotherapy to get to the bottom of it. Uh, but the treatment of the diarrhea is the treatment of the constipation. And in many occasions, uh, is associated with a small bowel bacterial overgrowth, either as a, conse a consequence of constipation that worsens the situation because of the methane, or even a triggering initiated factor. But in many occasions, um, I would treat both, treat the bacterial overgrowth and constipation. For a bacterial overgrowth, I tend and I like to document for the first time, because if you have bacterial overgrowth, it is a chronic condition. It is a recurring condition because the underlying cause is Parkinson. Unfortunately, we cannot cure. For I like to have the diagnosis objectively, and the way you make a diagnosis is a simple breath test. We give a sugar to, uh, to drink, and we collect your bread every 15 minutes for three hours. When I diagnose that one and make sure that you have it, then subsequently, when you had excess bloating or excess odorous gas or constipation, or explosive diarrhea, I don't need to put you through the test again. I know you had it and I can treat you. Wow, that's um, so much great information. There really is a lot you can do if you know what to d what what problems are are common, and uh, you really just need that expertise. So thank you so much for all of that. We have a great question from Joy, um, who asks, "How many years does constipation show up before a diagnosis of Parkinson's?" And then asks a uh, related question, is, which is, "How many years could?" small intestinal bacteria overgrowth show up before a diagnosis of Parkinson's? Okay. Well, <clears throat> it's a very interesting question, by the way. Um, the reason I smile because it's a major debate, not in my uh, opinion, but my neurology friends think it is uh, debatable. Uh, that is brain first or body first. Um, but before I explain that, there are no at least three very good epidemiological studies that clearly showed that constipation occurs in many patients, if not majority, years before the onset 
of Parkinson disease cardinal symptoms and sign that is motor symptoms. If I did a study from Honolulu that these are the longitudinal studies that they enrolled healthy subjects, uh, usually from the community and usually uh, late middle age or elderly people and follow them to death. And in many of those studies, the outcome was cardiovascular disease. And then gradually they added uh, brain issues such as Parkinson and Alzheimer. And then they asked uh, uh, participant questions. The Honolulu one, they asked uh, 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 participant about the bowel movement, not very sophisticated one. They asked them, are you constipated or not? And those that they say they have constipated, they have twofold increased risk of getting Parkinson 15 years later. And those that they safe reported severe constipation defined by need for laxative use, they have five-fold increased risk of uh, Parkinson. Now, the debate is whether these people had Parkinson to begin with, and the Parkinson happened to start from the nerves not in the brain, the nerves in the gut, and therefore constipation was manifestation of the Parkinson, or the constipation would result in changes in bacteria, and that would predispose them to get a brain one. And that's why people say the brain first is the one that they had the cardinal motor symptoms and later on they got constipation or at the same time they get constipation. Body first is other way around. In my opinion, the reason my neurology friends uh, dispute that, and they are right, there is overlap. It's like anything in medicine, there is no clear cut. But the bottom line is you are right. The constipation can happen before. But I want to highlight that constipation is extremely common in this country. 60% of American, adult American, when in a, in a uh, questionnaire, report constipation. Parkinson disease is one or two percent at most, and those above 65. For I don't think that if you have constipation, you're going to get Parkinson. If, I, if you have constipation, it is highly unlikely to have Parkinson. But if you have constipation, you have a higher chance of Parkinson if you never had uh, constipation. But I don't want to get you worried about it. For bacterial overgrowth, it has no longitudinal studies because that is not self-reported uh, uh, questionnaire. It has to have a test. Uh, but um, when we ask patients in a questionnaire that is recall, whether they had symptoms prior to uh, when they got shakiness and so on, such as bloating, gas, and many said yes. For I don't think that uh, we would be, I would be able to answer to see whether overgrowth happens before or after. One thing that I want to uh, uh, mention about the possibility that God get involved early on, study that we published with Dr. Shannon, um, that the way we did it, that I looked at the patients that uh, were seen in Parkinson disease clinic at Rush, or 2,000 of them, and I merged it with my database of patients I did colonoscopy, and happened they had polyp, and I took samples. And we identified three patients that I did a colonoscopy years before the diagnosis, two to five years. And I went back and stained their tissue for that Louis body, and all three, they were present. Subsequent to us, the French group reported 25 patients. But there is no doubt that the gut get involved in patients with Parkinson years before cardinal symptoms of Parkinson. It's the same thing, it's not just only God, the same things for a sleep disorder, REM sleep disorder, the same things for loss of a smell and so on. 
Excellent. So actually, you just answered a, another question that we were going to pose later for evidence that uh, alpha-synuclein is present in the gut. So uh, here we have Dr. Kishavarzian who performed some of those experiments showing um, alpha-synuclein in the gut earlier than uh, Parkinson's disease symptoms. So thanks for that information. We have a topic that's come up again and again already. This question is from Mira, but many other people asked. What are your thoughts on the use of probiotics in somebody with Parkinson's? And if you are a proponent of them, do you have any specific um, uh, qualifications of that probiotic? There's so many out there. Which one is a good one to use? Any thoughts on that? Okay. I'm going to declare my conf the intellectual conflict of interest. I don't favor probiotics for any chronic conditions. I, I, I uh, favor probiotics for infant diarrhea, for traveler diarrhea, maybe with antibiotic associated diarrhea. In my opinion, there has been no convincing study that use of probiotics have a major impact in any chronic diseases where changes in microbiota or dysbiosis has been reported, whether it's Parkinson's, whether it's in inflammatory bowel disease and so on. Yes, case report, yes, show few cases uh, here and there, yes, but a rigorous study has not been shown. And, and I'm, the reason is we are really putting the cart before the horses. We know that microbiota is important. Uh, and we know microbiota dictate the state of health and disease, but that is it. We are in a infancy. Of, yes, we started looking at it for the last two, 20 years, but we are still in infancy. We don't know how it, uh, it does it. And now using that limited knowledge um, to uh, treat by probiotic, I think is rather hubris and premature. Um, we have trillion of bacteria uh, and there is overlapping function as well. Uh, and if one thinks that adding one or two species of bacteria uh, will change the microbiota, I think is wishful thinking. And in fact, it's been shown that it hasn't done that. Uh, for I don't... Um, suggest to do that uh, but at the same time i said if, if you want to use it use it but i don't know whether uh, you are going to get value for the money you spend one piece of caution remember i said there are subset of bacteria that they have an enzyme it happen to be tyrosine decarboxylase that they uh, metabolize of levodopa and make your cinema to be not as effective. One of those bacteria that contain that enzyme is lactobacillus. And majority of uh, probiotics in the market is lactobacillus. And I, in fact, uh, encourage my patients to avoid lactobacillus. And it's an anecdote. And after I told them to stop lactobacillus probiotics, they said, they have less dyskinesia and so on. It's anecdote. But if you want to have a probiotics, I will do the probiotics that Mishnikov proposed. Mishnikov was a um, Russian physio uh, physiologist that in early 40s wonder why people living in Caucasus live more than 100 years old. And he went there and noticed that they drink fermented milk every day and he took that fermented milk and did analysis and he find that they have contained lots of lactic acid producing bacteria and he called them probiotics therefore if you want to have that you may have an authentic probiotics and that means fermented milk kefir uh, yogurt and that is what i said that is what i have by the way uh, i don't want to give unnecessary money to corporate america the other way that you can manipulate microbiota is prebiotics. Probiotics, the live bacteria that you think is a good bacteria to give to the people. Prebiotics is a food that you can give to, uh, you eat that promotes 
the growth of good bacteria. To me, it makes more sense because you don't manipulate, you trust the nature and your body, you give the good food for the bacteria and let them uh, do the job and it's not only one single bacteria. It's a conflict of interest because I have, been, I have developed some of those. Um, therefore, I haven't got any commercial money from it, but I just want to want to make sure that you know that uh, potential conflict of interest. And we have, we and others have shown those prebiotics, and I will explain to you what they are, indeed can impact uh, the bacteria in a positive way. They promote so-called good bacteria growth and um, decrease the growth of bad bacteria. Our intestine is Manhattan. It is a very difficult real estate for it is packed in order to get rid of one group of bacteria in order to promote the growth of a group of bacteria you have to get rid of the another tenant and that is the reason the prebiotic can do that one and uh, we have a study is under review is a prebiotics that I developed and we gave it to the patient with Parkinson's disease just for only uh, 10, uh, 20 days and their GI symptoms improved and the bacteria improved, intestinal leak was improved and even marker of the brain health improved and the symptoms of the score of the Parkinson's symptom, UPS star, improve, but whether it is relevant or not, I don't know. But the, what are the prebiotics? Prebiotics is a poorly absorbed carbohydrate. Oats, that is primarily uh, what I call them ancient grain. Oats, millet, um, chia, quinoa. These are the one that is a great source of prebiotics or uh, legumes such as um, lentil, uh, leafy greens such as kale. These are a major source of prebiotics. You don't have to, the prebiotics that are on the market, I do not suggest. These are uh, inulin based and a higher dose can even be inflammation. But why do you want to pay corporate America? Have a whole food and enjoy it. Even if, that's why I tell my patient with Parkinson, they should try to have organic, primarily plant-based Mediterranean diet. But I don't want you to be vegetarian. The, that uh, diet is full of prebiotics. That The reason I say organic, because we and others have shown that use of uh, preservative would negatively affect the microbiome. Uh, and I know that is and we know we have these studies, it increased your grocery um, uh, expense by 35%. And now with the inflation and so on, it may be very difficult. Uh, but uh, Mediterranean means lo uh, lots of extra virgin olive oil. Remember that olive oil has to be kept in the cupboard because if it gets exposed to sun, it becomes oxidized and it's no good. And also try to have an extra virgin olive oil, which is got dated, uh, because if it's old, that may not be as good. Um, lots of um, uh, nuts, but not peanut, uh, and lots of fish. You can have meat, but less meat. Uh, you can have kefir and uh, yogurt, and more importantly, what I call them, colored fruit, berries pomegranate, these are full of antioxidant and a good source of prebiotics. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, great information and a lot to take down about what a great PD diet is. Thank you for that. We have a completely different topic now uh, from Rita. You had mentioned uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy. Can you talk a little bit more about what that is? How do you get that started? Um, are there exercises you can do at home if you don't have formal physi uh, physiotherapy? Obviously, I'm not a physiotherapist, therefore I can't give you the details. Um, there is a muscle called puborectalis muscle that hog that start from the pubic bone goes to your tailbone, and it hog pretty much all the uh, organs in your pelvic: is rectum, bladder for women, 
uh, uh, uterus and it will angle the uh, rectum and by the way and that muscle goes all the way down and create the external sphincter is normally is contracted for you have got your sphincter tight and your rectum is angled which is great otherwise all of us would have been walking and just uh, leaking our stool when it comes the time to have a bowel movement that is stool in the rectum through the nerve it will try to order the blood muscle to relax to open up therefore the anger will open up sphincter will open up and one has defecation we are able to control it to prevent it for example if it's socially it's not acceptable that you want to wait in patient with parkinson disease that muscle is contracted and doesn't move as quickly as it should remain contracted and therefore you get that problem of this synergic defecation that's why many people use using the manual defecation because when you do a manual defecation you um, relax that muscles now the physiotherapist with expertise with pelvic floor physiotherapy it requires a special expertise you shouldn't go to the physiotherapist that knows how to do a physiotherapy of the neck and arms and all of those things and they will retool and retrain that uh, muscles to respond sometimes they do it with biofeedback sometimes without biofeedback uh, they teach you the appropriate position during defecation which by and large is squatting by raising your feet up when you are having the bowel movement and it typically um, they want two sessions a week and for eight to twelve weeks insurance will cover it it needs the doctor's prescription and then like anything else it, need, it requires perseverance that you have to continue those exercises that you will learn at home i do not believe it's useful you just go on uh, google and youtube and try to do it yourself it really needs to be uh, done at least for the initial phase uh, by the professional physiotherapist. Fantastic. Uh, we are amazingly at the end of the hour, and I didn't give any warning uh, to uh, to our participants or to you that we are at the end of the hour. So I apologize for that. Um, we have had so many questions that we were un unfortunately unable to answer, but I do want to um, hopefully answer those questions and uh, produce a, a list of the answers that I will share with all our registrants today. So look out for that uh, so that you hopefully, if you've asked a question today, will get an answer to your question. And uh, on that note, I wanna thank Dr. Keshavarzian for an amazing amount of information. I learned a lot that I'm gonna now share with my patients. So I really wanna thank you so much. I wanna also thank everyone for participating today, for asking all your questions. And again, hopefully we'll get answers to everything, uh, even if we didn't uh, talk about it today on this broadcast. And if you know someone who missed today's program, if you join late, if you want to watch this again, because there was so much information that you may have not completely integrated all of it, this recording will be available later today on our YouTube channel. So uh, get to our YouTube page and you can see uh, this broadcast again. And while you're there, please subscribe to APDA's YouTube channel to watch other broadcasts as well as anything new that comes to the APDA YouTube channel. Before we go, I want to alert you to our next episode of Dr. Gilbert Host, which will be on July 11th at 7 p.m. I'll be hosting three guests at that time who are care partners of people with PD, and they are ready to answer your questions live, just like today. So please register for that and join us on July 11th. We also have a website full of information, so please, for additional resources or other questions you may have about Parkinson's disease, please visit us at apdaparkinson.org.
Be sure to stick around for a few final messages. But before I go, I want to thank you again for joining us today, for participating, for asking your questions. And we hope to see you again on another APDA program really soon. Have a great rest of the afternoon. I'm Leslie Chambers, the President and CEO of the American Parkinson Disease Association. Each month across the country, APDA is providing support groups, exercise classes, and educational programs like this one to support the Parkinson's disease community. You can find all of our upcoming virtual events on our website at apdaparkinson.org events. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, I hope you will consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible. Your gift can help APDA support people living with PD through local programs, reliable resources, and groundbreaking research designed to find treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. Please donate today at apdaparkinson.org slash donate. And thank you so much for your support.